Oh, false beliefs. Uh, false beliefs about the economy. And I guess the, the single most fundamental false belief, and this back to the level of philosophy, I mean, this is not economics. They, they made a, a fundamental ontological error. And that is to say that they assume, they policymakers, general economists, that the, econ that the economy is uh, both uh, understandable and controllable. And the fact of the matter is, it, it is neither. And the ontological problem, it goes back to the question of what's the nature of the beast? And given the nature of the beast, what can you know about it? And I think the, the economy is an enormously complex uh, system involving millions and millions of people and organizations all around the world. Um, and it is constantly adapting. So the idea that you can actually really understand it and really control it, I think is a, is a very important false belief. And then there's all sorts of others. I mean, uh, one of them, for example, the idea that if you have price stability, uh, that uh, this implies there can be no major macroeconomic problems. And um, I think a lot of people are still holding on to that false belief in spite of the fact that we had no real inflation before this crisis, we had no real inflation before the Great Depression, we had no real inflation before the Great Recession in Japan, and yet people still stubbornly hold on to this false belief that if they've just got prices under control, everything will be just fine. Well, the monetary policy that's been followed since the crisis began in 2007 has been uh, extraordinarily um, enthusiastic and aggressive. And they've done all sorts of different things. I mean, they've done lowered interest rates to zero. We've got quantitative easing, qualitative easing, forward guidance, operation twist. I mean, they've done an enormous number of things. And I, I guess I would make two main points. The, the first point is that the, the initial easing by central banks in the face of the financial crisis uh, was absolutely appropriate. Uh, the issue was financial stability or not. And central bankers chose financial stability, which is perfectly sensible. But over time, the objective of the policy has sort of morphed into supporting aggregate demand. And on that front, um, I guess I worry, one, that it won't work, and two, that it will have an awful lot of unintended consequences. And I think as we view the crisis now from seven years into it, and many of us still sort of wearing an apprehensive look that it might get worse rather than better, uh, I think we're seeing empirical evidence that in fact it has not worked the way that we wanted it to work. And we're seeing increasing evidence of the, of the undesired consequences. Uh, not least in the undesired consequences is that uh, this problem started with the advanced market economies, including the Eurozone, uh, but now it has actually spread uh, out to all of the emerging markets. So that whereas in 2000, which of course nobody anticipated. So in 2007, I guess people looked upon the emerging markets sort of like the, a bit like the locomotive, remember back in the 1960s, they looked upon the emerging markets as part of the solution to the problem in the advanced market economies. But now the emerging market economies have got exactly the same problems, which they've imported, an unintended consequence, and um, now the emerging markets are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Well, to move out of the current situation, item number one, I think, is that we must understand the limitations of monetary policy. And what that means is we effectively face an insolvency problem rather than an illiquidity problem. The levels of debt globally now are just unsustainably high. Now the question is, what are you gonna do about that? You can pretend to have a solution by keeping interest rates low and debt service low, but you simply encourage people to take on more debt, which means that in the end, the situation's got worse, not better, the unintended consequences. So what's, what's the alternative? I think there's a number of things that can be suggested. 
And I'm, I'm not politically naive here. I understand why it's going to be very hard to do it. Um, I would say essentially four things. One of them is governments with fiscal room to maneuver should use it, and they should try to give themselves more room for maneuver by laying out credible medium-term plans for getting government debts under control. Uh, I think, too, that as we look at the structure of spending, that we need a lot more emphasis on public infrastructure, on education, uh, things that will pay off big dividends, but obviously only over time. I think we need to look again at wages. I think wages have gotten squeezed in almost an unconscionable way in many, many countries. Uh, that may reverse itself normally, I, I, I don't know. But we should do that to spur spending. But I think there's a lot of things that we could do on the supply side too. And one of them is uh, look the debt overhang problem right in the face and basically admit we have a problem and then decide how the debt has got to be restructured. Because it's, it's better to get 50 cents on the dollar than to get nothing on the dollar. And lastly, all of these structural reforms. Uh, but you'll notice that all of these things that I'm suggesting are in the hands of governments. They're not in the hands of central banks. <laughs>